We've got a, a really cool question uh, from another one of our Chapel Hill Kunoichi that I would love to uh, throw out to everybody. Um, if you guys are okay with this, Jenny McGowan uh, asked, would love to know what challenges each of you women have faced in keeping up with your training. How did you overcome those? And did you ever have a point where you wanted to quit? Um, Nikki, you were just going, do you have any, any particular challenges uh, that you had to overcome and any point where you sort of question, was this your path? I, I don't think to, to, to that extent, but I've had some really challenging experiences and specifically during my time in Red Belt when we were learning a lot of the throws, learning a lot of um, being able to receive back throws and forward throws and being able to work through the ikemi. Um, I had, and it's still kind of like a chronic issue that I have, but I've been able to work through it and improve it, but a hip and back injury from, from running um, that was really challenging to my training. And there was, I remember that there was one class where I, I got up after being thrown, taken like, um, I don't know what, what we were doing, but I got up off the mat and I just kind of stood there and I walked off. Like I just, I walked off to the mat. I went into the changing room and I was like, I can't, can't do anymore. Not today. Um, but what really helped me one was finding a really good physical therapist who sticks needles into me and it really helps a lot. Um, and also improving my physical fitness, strengthening the muscles that needed to be strengthened to be able to support that kind of activity. So lifting heavy weights definitely has helped me um, a lot manage that pain, manage the injury and keeping me on the mat, being able to train. I feel like I got a front row seat watching you work through a lot of that. And uh, I know you and I had a lot of conversations back and forth because I've got a, a bit of a back thing that I, I have to navigate as well. But what was inspiring to me was how you were really intelligently attacking the problem. You know, you were finding the solutions. You were very methodically working up through the weights. You were um, very mindful about your training and your workouts, which is why, you know, if you question at all why we've asked you to be in front of the mat, it's because of the the really intelligent approach that you took to that training that that so impressed me um you know i i went from you know sort of thinking of myself as you know like i'm, I'm probably the guy that knows the most about kettlebells here to now like i i, I watch you do something i'm like oh, i should ask nikki how she did that because that was pretty cool so uh that that's why you know i i was able to watch that uh Dr. Anna, uh, what about you? Any points where you wanted to quit? Any any big challenges that you've had to face? Yeah, there have been. Um, I think the, the biggest one in recent years um, was actually just traveling from Charlotte to Chapel Hill. So, yeah, it's only a two-hour drive, but I was doing that in the middle of graduate school where I was working 60 to 80 hours a week every single week and a lot of times so I would only be able to go on Fridays and Saturdays so five o'clock would hit on Saturday on Friday and I would be done teaching classes all day and then it's like well it would be really nice to go home and take a nap or go out to happy hour with my colleagues but I'm sitting in Charlotte traffic for like anywhere from two to three hours trying to make it to the dojo hoping that I make it to the 8 p.m. class on time um, so th there were definitely moments where I was just stuck in traffic kind of thinking like oh my god like what am I doing with my life <laughs> like you know is, is, is this worth it like shouldn't I just find a local dojo and you know do a different martial art um, but uh, what, what helped me kind of overcome that challenge, if you will, was just simply stepping on the mat, just going through that Tory gate and kind of leaving that outside world outside. And Amy, I think that you mentioned that when you were training while you were in grad school, it basically saved your sanity. And in a way, that's what it did for me as I was um, going through graduate school. So just being able to, you know, overcome that hurdle of like, oh my God, I'm too exhausted. I don't want to drive and I'd rather be doing other things. But just, you know, once I got there and I was on the mat fully and, you know, interacting with all of my friends and my training partners, um, it, it made everything worth it. And for me, you know, just kind of savoring that and also keeping in mind, you know, the, your why, like, why do you train and always kind of keeping that on the forefront helped me overcome that. Awesome. Dr. Amy, any, any challenges that really stand out or 
points where you questioned uh, question Toshindo or question training? Well, first I want to say I'm just so in awe and admiration for the dedication both Nikki and Anna have shown. And I love hearing these stories because I think when you're new and you see black belts, you don't necessarily know what it took to get there. So I think it's really helpful to hear the stories. And Nikki, to me, it's inevitable that you became an instructor. And I mean that with love and respect is just a compliment. So like you absolutely need to be there. It's, it's, it's great. And Anna, I'm so happy. I, 24 years later, I'm still so glad I finished my PhD. So I'm just like projecting all that <laughs> un happiness on you. Um, I'll say for me, the biggest thing I had to do really was make the decision that I was really going to train. Like I couldn't do it halfway. Halfway wasn't going to work. I had to really do it. And for me, that meant taking private lessons. I just needed a little more focused time um, with that feedback. And I was in a really lucky position to be able to do that. So all the instructors have been like incredibly helpful and supportive, but I just felt like sometimes I needed, if I needed more practice, I just needed to, to put the time in. Um, I'll say two things really quick. One is testing at Mountain Quest is really, really, push me past all the physical limits I thought I could, you know, push me farther than I thought I could go. So that was a, a good experience. And um, I've done it twice now, so I've really had that experience. Um, so that's been really great to learn. And then the other thing I'll say that always sticks with me is when I was, before I started training and I was watching my husband and son at graduation. So I was like, you know, just that mom at graduation for a little while, um, I would watch going through the levels and I would see the yellow belts and I would think, oh yeah, maybe I could do that. Maybe. And then I'd, I'd see the blue belts and be like, I don't know, maybe I could do that. But then I would see the red belts. And I think a Jean Messe was like such a kick-ass mm -hmm. woman ahead of me. I'd be like, I could never do that. Red, green, brown, black. Like I thought I, I couldn't picture it. And picture myself doing that. But what I finally decided is when you're training, you have to trust the path. And it's kind of like you're on a dark road and you have, you're driving a car and you have headlights. And so the headlights, you can see a little bit down the road, but after that, you really can't see past where your headlights end. And so that's where you have to trust your instructors and your training partners and the brilliant, beautiful curriculum laid out by Anshu Stephen Hayes. Like the path is there. Your teachers will lead you. Your training partners will be there for you. So don't, you don't have to look too far ahead, you know, just trust in the process, keep, keep training, keep showing up, do your best and trust in that process. And your teachers will get you as far as you can go, which is probably to black belt if that's what you really want. And beyond. Yes. Yeah. And yes. beyond, because that's really where, um, you know, once you achieve your black belt, you know, that's kind of the, you know, tip of the cap to you that you've, you've got an understanding of what our basics are, you know, that make up this beautiful martial art. And now the, the rest of your black belt in this Don journey and these levels of black belt is really an exploration of this is how you're going to direct your will, you know, using, utilizing these basics, you know, I think that's one thing that, you know, in talking with some women who have trained in the martial arts in the past, and from Dr. Tiemann, your explanation of what it is that you felt you were seeing happen on the mat and initially what have, may have instilled a little bit of self-doubt and thinking, I don't know if I could do that. Um, you know, what I think you come to find as, as it pertains to our martial art is we're not really doing things to anyone. We're positioning ourselves in such a way that the harder they try to do things to us, the worse it becomes from them. Naturally with a, a bit of intention involved, but it's not so much of how hard can I strike or how hard can I kick or how much weight can I manipulate over my shoulder or through my hips. It's a matter of if I just place myself in a certain position at a certain time with a certain intention, then these things happen themselves. But you don't get to experience that unless you're actually in the mix doing it yourself. So looking at it, it appears like, whoa, he just you know, or she just took this person and threw them over their hips. And it really actually wasn't that way. Actually, what I did was position myself in such a way that their balance was manipulated because of what they were trying to do to me. 
But from a, an outsider looking in, it looks as though we're doing all this dynamic stuff. Dynamic things are happening, but we're not the generator of those. We are kind of in uh, in tandem with those things happening. And that's the real beauty of that. You know, so we all learn from these basic levels on, you know, where to put ourselves. Why are we putting ourselves in a certain position? What time does it take for us to get into this position? And then you learn all these basic skills. And now, you know, as a need on and Nikki, you're, you're a need on as well, correct? You're not. Yes, well, you no, certainly would have fooled me by things that I've seen her do. So, um, and, and Anna, what rank are you? Show it on. You're showing on as well. So yeah, really for the three of you, I mean, the, the, you're kind of what I like to call as far as the, the house of training is concerned, you're in like the foyer. You just like entered the door and now you're in the foyer. Now you're going to see these different rooms and these rooms all represent, you know, some aspect of your basic training, but now it's going to get even more personalized because now you're going to get to see how you can direct your intention and your will to, um, create the circumstances that you want. So your, uh, basics become even more magic. So that's, uh, that's going to be fun. Fun to see you guys, uh, go through that. So, you know, you were, you just, each one of you just answered a question as far as what your challenges were, um, you know, based on your own specific journey through the training. So a question came up and actually Hardy, you've asked this question before in your masters of Toshin Do series. And that would be, and it's a great question. Somebody earlier I'm, I'm watching here uh, asked it. If you could go back, knowing what you know now, go back to your your white belt self, what um, what's one bit of advice that you would give yourself as you first started out in this training? And then maybe if we can complicate it a little bit, what you've learned about yourself in the training that you would go back and give someone new and maybe someone specifically as being a woman um, that you would impart some knowledge to. Why don't we kind of reverse the clock here? And we're not the reverse the clock, but the rotation. Let's start with Dr. Anna. Isn't that isn't that cool to be called Dr. Anna? Um, it still sounds weird whenever people call <laughs> me that. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> so, um, Dr. Anna, what would you tell your white belt self, and what bit of um, experience have you gained that you would pass on to somebody specifically? And and I am because you know there's a specific reason why we had the three of you on because you are women and you are training in Toshin Do. So let's, let's kind of take that, that lens and look at it from that way, from a woman's perspective. So Dr. Anna. I think ooh, so many things that I would say. Um, one thing would be uh, to calm down. Um, Cause when I first started, I was like, so hard on myself and so critical and like oh my god i need to get this amount of classes and get these many stripes and get you know this belt by this date and i just put so much added pressure on myself to um just progress as quickly as i possibly could so that i think that's the first thing that i would tell myself is to just calm down slow down just enjoy the process uh but i think the another thing especially as it relates to me as a woman is um because back then when i first started i had such low self-esteem. Um, I think I would really drive home the point that, hey, you are worth protecting. Um, and you absolutely have every right to protect yourself and to stand up for yourself. Um, especially I, you know, grew up in a culture where unfortunately, you know, there is a lot of machismo. Um, and that as a woman, it's been, you know, growing up difficult learning how, how to navigate that, but really just, you know, as I'm starting Toshin Do as a white belt, it's like, oh, I'm learning all of these physical techniques. But I think there was a part of me that still needed to hear, like, you are truly 100% worth protecting and you are worth protecting yourself. And you have the power to do that for yourself. Like a part of me kind of knew that, but I don't think I fully 100% like truly felt it and believed it in my bones back when I started. So that I think that's probably the main thing that I would tell myself um, as I was starting out. And when when did you feel that 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 flip or that switch flip? Because what you're talking about, for those of you who are tuning in that maybe aren't training in Toshindo, and my first question would be, <laughs> why not? Um, but for those of you that are tuning in that aren't training, this is an example of our earth element that, that, um, that self-value, finding your self-worth, 
your sense of importance, your sense of your rooted place um, in the world. So that that's a that's a great point of view and a great perspective that you had. And for you, when did that flip? You know, when did you flip the switch on that where you felt like, you know what, uh, I'm seeing my self worth in this, but you really like you kind of owned it. Yeah, it, it's difficult for me to pinpoint like one specific point uh, in my life um, where, where that switch kind of occurred. Uh, but, but I do think honestly that a lot of it, I'm um, just reciting the student creed. Like I think there's a reason why the first line is I believe in myself, you know, and having to say that over and over again, like each time, like to open up every class. Um, but I think it, for me, it was more of a gradual change rather than, you know, um, just a, a sudden change. And I'm not sure when exactly I, I noticed that, but it was more just looking at myself like out of the mat, like, oh, do I speak up when I want to? And when I have something to say, you know, am I more likely to stand up for myself? Am I, you know, just walking and carrying myself with a little bit more confidence? So for me, it was a, a bit more gradual. And I can say that I could definitely just in the first, um, gosh, even in the first few months, I think I displayed some of those qualities. Um, but for me, it was more of a, a gradual process. Awesome. Thank you for that. Nikki, let's go to you. Same uh, question. What would you give your, what information would you give your white belt self? What advice and, uh, and what is it that you kind of, you know, learned um, some kind of a major breakthrough that you had while you were training? I, th I think my advice to my white belt self is the advice that I should give myself now, but I don't take. Um, and it's the kind of like, Anna, like stop being so hard on yourself. Like, mm -hmm. I am my own worst critic and the voice in my head is more critical and meaner than anything that any instructor could ever say to me. Um, so I would definitely tell myself, like, ease up a little bit. You're doing great. <laughs> like, you're doing fine. Um, you know, growing up, I played sports and always had, like, confidence and, like, competence in my physical abilities to be able to, to train and, and do things. Um, so I, I think that that has carried over in, into my training. So um, that confidence has kind of been there kind of in the background, even though, you know, I kind of have like this little bit of an internal struggle. Um, but that's what I would, would share and like tell other women who are, who are thinking about training is like, you can develop that confidence, like whatever it is, um, whatever you're, you're doubting and thinking like, oh, well, I can't do it because of this, or I can't do it because of that. It's like, you totally can, um, get out on the mat. We're going to have some fun. Cause it is fun. It's the funnest thing I've ever done. Um, but building that confidence and that self image is something that I think is invaluable that women can take away from Toshindo. Awesome. And Dr. Amy. Um, I would tell my white belt self, you can really do this and you're going to go a lot farther than you would ever imagine right now. Um, for people working toward their black belt, I just, it's funny. I'm glad you said what you had said, Scott, like to me, black belt is actually a starting point but I understand it as an, it's a really important goal. I was very goal oriented toward my black belt. And then beyond that, it feels like I can let go of that goal oriented striving and just train and enjoy and explore. Um, but that like last year before you, when you're working toward your black belt, I would just say, go get it. Like show up, train really hard, run. I am not a runner. I hate running unless I'm playing tennis. And I actually ran, you know, jogged with, thank goodness for Claire Motti helping me run before Mountain Quest. So I was lucky because I had my family members who I saw how hard they trained the last year be before they tested. And so just, you have to want it. You have to go get it when it's your time to test. Um, so do it. You can do it. Um, for women in Toshindo, I found it to be a really wonderful art and Anshu Rumiko Hayes is like my idol and I've had the privilege of training with her and, and just the way she moves and the way she explains things I just really respect her her I respect the fact that we have Anshu Rumiko Hayes and Anshu Stephen K Hayes and together they're just fantastic and I think it's really important to have women role models and women teaching because when you have women teaching you then see that 
each person does need to personalize th their taijutsu and you're not just copying what any one teacher is doing. And, but I think if you are a man training with a male teacher who is about your size and build and physique, like you might be able to get away with thinking that what you're supposed to do is copy the teacher because that would usually work for you. Um, but when you're a woman, you realize, okay, I mean, just when you're different, when you're a different size, when you're a kid, when you know, whatever, when you're, when you're different, you get to realize that, okay, yes, I need to copy the model I'm seeing, but I need to adjust it for my size and my angle and where I am relative to my training partners. So I think when you, the more different teachers you see, the more everyone benefits from seeing the variety of, of everyone does it a little bit differently and women do it differently for men. And, uh, and having men see women teaching and then they have to adjust it for themselves relative to that is really good too. And, but to me, the dojo has just been such an accepting, wonderful place, um, you know, as a parent, as someone who is a teacher who works with kids, like just seeing all kinds of people, all kinds of kids, everyone just like, to me, the mat is a magical place. It's a special magical place where whatever you do in the rest of your life, it doesn't matter. And you can just come to this place and train and meet people and, and all be together. And so Thank you for that. It's 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 really a, you've created a really special place for us.